Watch this. Do words matter? Of course they do. Even the words hidden in the fine print? Probably just as much. At the State House, a group of lawmakers made the case today that words, even those from decades ago, do really matter. Perhaps it's been known by some for some time. But when it was brought to the attention of a Boise lawmaker, she wanted to do something about it. Senator Melissa Wintrow was shown the deeds to several homes around Boise. And in those deeds, there's language that outlines who can live there and who cannot based on race. The enforcement of that concept went away long ago, but the words remain in those documents and they cause some confusion for some homeowners who don't know the history of it. Joe Paris explains how lawmakers are addressing decades of disenfranchised, commu disenfranchised communities and the racist language that remains in many of those homes deeds. Legislation to correct racist language in Idaho home deeds and covenants passed the Idaho Senate unanimously early Wednesday. It's a great step on the topic, says Bill's sponsor, Senator Melissa Wintrow. It educates our community about the past in order to try to prevent those kind of things from the future. In recent years, Idahoans have found and spoken out about racially restrictive language found in documents like the deed to their home. Essentially, those deeds in question say that only members of the white race could own or occupy the home. Wintrow says she had constituents reach out to her after they saw it in their deed. Her eyes would get giant, right? Like, oh my gosh, that language, because, you know, it reads, it, you know, succinctly that only whites or people of the Caucasian race may live or own or possess the property, right? Wintrow's bill creates a process for homeowners to get that racist language corrected through the county clerk's office. You go down to the county clerks, you ask for the modification form, you make note of the language that needs to be addressed, and then that goes on file in your chain of title. So there it sits. So if you do uh, sell your home when you're getting those closing documents, that modification document will be front and center in the chain of title to demonstrate that, hey, that's null and void and not, 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 uh, should not be there anymore. It won't get rid of the language entirely. Instead, adding a page to the end of the deed that nullifies that language. Wintrow says the process with the clerk's office is free of charge under her legislation. She adds, though, that this is also about educating our community about the past and being honest. When we hear all the myth and misinformation that surrounds us about critical race theory and these kinds of things, this is a perfect example of how we have incorporated racist attitudes, values, and beliefs into a law and practice that was intentional to keep some people out of wealth. And so that's an important thing to acknowledge. The legislation still needs to pass the Idaho House before it could end up on Governor Little's desk for approval. In the Senate, the legislation passed with every senator voting in favor. Wintrow says that sends a strong message. I, I would hope that would say to folks that we acknowledge what we've heard today and we acknowledge those injustices of the past. And while we may not be inherently responsible for those past actions, we are responsible in the present to uh, address those things and really pave the way for a more just and fair society going forward. Senator Wintrow says this is a good step, but more action is needed on the topic, a topic that draws emotional conversations, acknowledging the history of our country and the impacts it has today. Looking eyeball to eyeball that language and racism to say, you know, how do we address it? And it's, and it's not as easy, you know, as just fixing this need, but it certainly does open the door for more conversations and more understanding. All right, Joe, 1968, the uh, Fair Housing Act got rid of this language or made it unenforceable, basically. It didn't get rid of it, obviously. But how widespread is this issue? Well, actually, there's a lot of research going on to it in our communities right now, and they know that this isn't like four or five deeds. There are thousands of deeds across, not to say the county, but the entire state that includes racist language and racially restrictive language. And there's, there's really work going on right now in a few institutions to figure out just exactly how widespread this is. And also, they're mapping all of this to figure out, okay, what clusters and what areas was this most common in? It's a very interesting conversation, Brian, but again, just to reiterate, uh, the actual language in these deeds were all outlawed in 1968 under the Federal Fair Housing Act. Again, though, this is really a technicality that lawmakers agree is important to take on. And it's worth noting that if your house was built before 1968, you might have something like this on your deed. All right, thank you very much, Joe. And you know, it's not just neighborhoods and house deeds out there with such language. Last week when we started talking about this bill, we had a viewer send us a copy of a deed from 1950 
from a cemetery. Clarence Orton sent us this copy of a plot purchased by his parents at the Cloverdale Memorial Park Cemetery. Section 161 in Block 1 of the Valley View District, it says. From, for $275 or $270, Clarence and Ruby Orton were granted a piece of land for a place for the burial of human dead remains of the white race only, it says. In a deed to be buried for, like, for eternity. I spoke with the current owner of the Cloverdale Cemetery, and he told me that was language from long ago, back before and when the Gibsons owned it. It no longer exists in cemetery deeds at Cloverdale Cemetery. But the fact that it existed ever, as we've talked about, is quite telling. Senator Wintrow told Joe Paris today, places like cemeteries, those are going to be next on the list that are going to be under some sort of change. All right, well, the full house, not the Tanners, but the lawmakers, didn't get much done today. Nothing, really. In fact, because, well, Representative Ron Nate of Rexburg used a parliamentary move to try and get a personal bill to get a hearing on the floor. Here's the Cliff Notes version. Representative Nate halted action on the House floor today to get his personal bill, that's House Bill 448, out of the House and Ways Committee and brought it to try to get it to the floor where they could talk about it. That bill would repeal Idaho's grocery tax. A good idea, right? Well, normally bills have to go through a step-by-step -step process. Committee introduction, they got public hearings, then debate on the House floor. Personal bills, though, done a little differently. Those are sent to the House and Ways, Commi House Ways and Means Committee. And that committee, kind of like a catch-all. And they typically don't meet in that committee till toward the end of the session as a way to get bills moving through quickly. But according to Representative Nate, his bill, which he introduced back on January 19th, he says it's being held there by committee chairman, Representative Paul Amador. So he attempted to invoke Rule 17 of the House. That allows members to try, of the House to try and bring a bill to the floor after the bill has been in committee for at least five days. Nate says Amador is holding the bill in committee and not allowing it to have a hearing. I go through the process and the rules. I go to the committee chair. The committee chairs sometimes have accepted it and put it in their drawer. Sometimes have accepted it, printed it, and then put it in their drawer. Sometimes they don't even accept it. So going through that process of the rules with an earnest attempt to change Idaho law, what is left? The only other option within the rules, which, yes, were adopted unanimously, is to submit it as a personal bill. Essentially, Representative Nate is saying Amador is vetoing his bill, even though he doesn't have the power to do that. That power belongs only to the governor. Representative Amador made a motion to keep that bill in committee, while Representative Nate asked it to be debated on the House floor. Lawmakers somewhat split on that idea. And in eight years, I have never once done anything as a personal bill. And I have been turned down by every single chairman in this body, on this side and on that side, on policy that I believe sincerely that is good. And it sends me back to the drawing board to get more support and make better policy. I, I do not run personal bills for any other reason except I am denied by chairman or the speaker d diverts them to a, a, a different committee. A bill that is introduced as a personal bill, quite frankly, might not be ready for prime time. And they might not get as far along in the process as you would like. It's kind of how that works. And it is a process. And there are actually more than 20 bills waiting for a hearing in the Ways and Means Committee, including McCrossey's, as he mentioned, his Add the Words bill. Remember that? Today's motion passed. Not along party lines, though. 49 to 20, meaning Representative Nate's bill will stay in committee until it eventually, maybe, gets a hearing. All right, yesterday we told you about another bill related to the grocery tax. Instead of getting rid of it, though, one lawmaker hoping to increase the tax credit by about 20 bucks a year. That led to this question from Steve. I wonder how many other states, U.S. states, charge sales tax on food and groceries. It would be interesting to know. Turns out we're not the only state in the union that still has a grocery tax. In fact, more than a fifth of us, a fifth of our states have this tax on groceries. However, Idaho is the only state that offers a grocery tax credit for everyone. These states here, listed on your map, these are the ones that have this. Utah, Hawaii, South Dakota, Kansas, Mississippi, Oklahoma, Tennessee, Alabama, Arkansas, Illinois, Missouri, and Vermont. And those tax rates differ by state. We should point out that Kansas offers a partial grocery tax credit, but only for those in low-income households, the disabled and in with the elderly. All right, switching gears a little bit. Today is February 8th. Written out numerically, it is 0208. Oh, 208. Say it like that. 208 day. In honor of that, we wanted to do a little something to commemorate the 208. Little nuggets of knowledge, some trivia games, fast factoids, that kind of stuff. But first, we thought we'd start at the beginning of the 208, like with the twisted history of how Idaho got its name. Way back when, 
The Western U.S. was full of wide open spaces, already occupied by Native Americans, who were quickly getting squeezed by pioneers and prospectors. So these territories, with names like Nebraska, Washington, Utah, they covered a lot of, well, territory. And by the time we got to the Civil War, Congress was splitting up these places. These new places needed new names, and if you look at the westward expansion of the country, new places took up old Native American words, or the English interpretation thereof. Think Michigan, Ohio, or Illinois. So that must be where Idaho got its name, right? In 1860, the Utah Territory was beginning to make a name for itself in mining. But it was big, and about to be broken up into states. And they needed names. The story goes there was a congressional delegate named George M. Willing, not pictured, from the young mining community around what is today Colorado. Allegedly, George offered up the name Idaho to Congress, claiming it meant gem of the mountains. However, those who lived there, they wanted something chic, something, oh, Native American, because, you know, everyone was doing it. Oh, it's, it's, it's native, claimed George Willing, willingly. It's, uh, it's Shoshone, yeah, that's it, he said. Except, old George was a known con artist. And right after Congress voted to approve the new name, they found out Idaho wasn't a native word at all. And those newly minted Idahoans, they wanted none of it. And asked for the name Colorado back, believing if they couldn't find an Indian word, well, then a Spanish word will do just fine. But Idaho, well, that wasn't too far away. Yeah, Colorado's a little south on that map. But Idaho, up there in the north, three years later, 1863, the eastern part of the Washington Territory was split off, as you saw there, when gold was discovered in the Boise Basin and in the Clearwater country up north. There was a steamboat up there that took miners to the gold camps. And the story goes it was named Idaho. So when Congress needed a name for this new territory, you guessed it, Idaho. Those who forget history, even recent history, are doomed to repeat it, apparently. And there are still stories out there that claim Idaho is a Native American word that means gem of the mountains. But it's not. It's not Nez Perce, it's not Shoshone, it's not Yakima, it's not Arapaho. Bottom line, Idaho was conceived by the conceit of a con man. Cool. More celebration of Idaho on 208 day. More than just, well, you know, potatoes. Baked, boiled, roasted or mashed, frozen fresh or canned. Potato bread, potato pancakes, served scalloped or au gratin. Fries, French or home, tots, gems, wedged, spiraled, sliced into chips. You get the idea. Before we get to that though. I'm super happy to be able to say something positive. Some good news coming from the public health perspective. And don't forget, send us your answers and also your comments and your questions to the number on your screen, 208-321-5614. We want to hear from you. And stick around, because we're going to reveal some of your answers, including your comments, at the end of the show. We're hopeful that since we've seen the peak um, already come in mid to late January, and we might start being uh, moving on the downward slope. 
See those fingers crossed there. It's not Friday, but we're feeling good about uh, this news that we're hearing from Idaho's health leaders. We've hit our Omicron peak, apparently. Actually, we're about two weeks past it. As with all the other surges, what happens is um, the virus runs rampant through um, the available population that it can, and then eventually it stops being transmitted and cases go back down. But I want to be really upfront. Just because cases are going down, they're still incredibly high. I mean, we we are. This is not over. That's because there's still a lot of us that are unvaccinated out there. Basically, we spread it around and around until there was hardly anywhere for it to go. And while that is good news, there's still a positivity, statewide positivity percentage of about 34%, seven times higher than where we want to be for a pandemic, which is below five. And we are still in crisis standards of care in most of southern Idaho right now, meaning our hospitals are still overwhelmed, not necessarily with COVID only patients, but with just everything. COVID on top of that, specifically because of staffing shortages and may not be able to provide adequate care to those that come in. Another reason, the national blood shortage. So if you can donate blood, you are asked, please do so. Make an appointment. All right, we've already established the self-proclaimed KTVB holiday of 208 day. It's February 8th. We're going to play a little trivia game called fill in the blank, and we want wrong answers only on this one. Number one. The longest blank in North America is in Idaho. The longest blank in North America is in Idaho. Number two, the deepest blank is in or in North America is in Idaho. Looking for the deepest now. Finally, we all know Idaho can get high. We have a lot of mountains out there. I don't know what you were thinking about, but this is what we're talking about. Idaho's home to the highest what? in the world. The highest what? Remember, send us wrong answers only. You want to sneak in a right one? That's fine. But we want to see some of your best wrong answers to these questions. Also keep in mind, we are a PG-13 show and under the discretion of the FCC. So yeah, we're going to reveal your wrong answers and the right ones at the end of the show.
Uh, there's some warmer temperatures out there in the future. Can't get enough 208 day? Good, because we got more for you. The 208 is known for a lot of things, and apparently being excessive is one of them. New data out this month. Idaho drinks more wine than any other state per capita. 1.21 gallons based on alcohol content of wine. We we're up from 1.9 last year, so we've got that going for us, which is nice. We're also known as the lentil capital of the world. And wait, there's more. I know what you're thinking. What about potatoes, right? Well, we're up there. Idaho provides about a third of the country's potato production, which is nearly about 14 billion pounds of potatoes. But we're also responsible for about 70% of America's commercial trout production. Some big numbers. Okay, but how about this? It's time for uh, three truths and a lie about the 208. Normally, it's two, but we're going to feel generous today. Here goes. Guess which one of these statements is a lie? Number one, Idaho has the only state seal designed by a woman. Emma Edwards Green did it in 1891, and she only used her initials on her design entry, so no one would know it was done by a woman. Number two, Idaho is the center of the universe, so claimed by the mayor of Wallace in 2004. And it's pinpointed to a manhole cover in the middle of an intersection. So go ahead and send your teenage daughter out there to stand out in the middle of it, and she'll feel right at home. Am I right? All right, number three, the first nuclear-powered city in the world was Arco, Idaho. When they flipped the switch in 1955, it only lasted about an hour, but it was enough for, uh, oh, those are the answers. What did we, hold on a second, we'll just get to this. Number four, Evil Knievel harnessed nuclear energy to jump the uh, Snake River Canyon successfully, Twin Falls in 1974. We want to know which one of those you think is a lie out of those four statements. All right, having some games today here on the 2-8, because it is, after all, 2-8 day, and we asked you to kind of fill in the blank earlier in the show on some of the uh, sentences. We gave you three of them. 
First one, fill in the blank. The longest blank in North America is in Idaho. Let's see what some of your answers are. Uh, it is longest. That's that is the correct answer. I kind of wanted to see what the actual answer were. Let's go to the answers here. Longest roads to nowhere. Somebody said deepest potholes would be the answers for those or fishtails. Let's uh, all right. Let's see what some of the other answers might be here uh, since they're not on the board. But maybe the longest walking path is in Idaho. Somebody says deepest. Nope. Highest flying potato. Yeah. In New Year's Eve on Idaho. That would be a good answer. The longest undammed river would be salmon. Uh, wrong answer. Deepest canyon. Hell's Canyon. Highest town. Stanley. I think the wrong answer. All of these is potato. Isn't that the answer to all questions in Idaho? That's a very good question. Longest ski run, maybe deepest, sincere people, highest vibration. Peggy's I don't what is uh, longest gondola, deepest canyon, highest lake, Jeannie and Boise close on those longest French fry, deepest potato root, highest mountain located potato farm, says Sherry from Nampa. I've, I've never heard of half of these things. Longest toenail, deepest thinkers, highest stack of pancakes. Idaho is home to the deepest pothole, says Janet in Meridian. All right, let's get to some of these real answers. Oh, what about highest stupidity rate? Oh, that one's got in there a little bit. The uh, <laughs> we're going to go with the uh, longest red light, the deepest pothole and the highest steal the flag hiding place. That's a good choice. The right answers. Longest dry spell in Idaho, maybe that could be it. Yes, we have been seeing a dry spell. How about some of the right answers? Let's look at those. So we're looking at the longest blank in North America. That is in what is that supposed to be? We would have accepted gondola ride or floating boardwalk. The gondola ride is the one that's up at Silver Mountain Resort in Kellogg. It's 3.1 miles. The floating boardwalk that's at the Coeur d'Alene Resort built in 1985 and it is 3,300 feet long. Number two, the deepest blank in North America in I is in Idaho. What a we got what you said already. The answer, by the way, is the deepest river gorge. That would be Hell's Canyon, which is about 7,913 feet deep, 10 miles wide at some points. Grand Canyon, by the way, only about 6,000 feet deep. Finally, we all know Idaho can get high. We have a lot of mountains. That's what we said. Yep. The highest what in the world here in Idaho? Navigable River. Now, that's just a claim. The St. Joe River in the Bitterroot Range, way up in the Panhandle, 6,500 feet all the way down to about 21, 29 feet. Yeah, apparently you can get some ships up that thing, some boats, some pretty good ones.